G'day everyone, and welcome to episode 10 of the Risky Rollers podcast. I'm Dalton, I'm joined by Lockie. Ooh, hello! And today we're going to talk a bit about uh, some hobby and a bit about some lore and what we've been reading. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm excited. Episode 10, bro, I can't believe we're at episode 10 already. 10, 10 episodes, <laughs> it, it's, it's come up so fast. I mean, I guess it's, it makes sense considering we're doing this weekly, so you know, it's I not... mean, it's been 10 weeks. Yeah, this, exactly. This is, how, this is how weeks work, yeah. but still, it's... It's insane to think how quickly this has come around. It feels like a blister of time. Mm, yeah, yeah, 100%. Blisteringly fast, yeah. Yeah. Um, right, so, um, as always, you go to Dice Arcade to get uh, get minis at a great discount. Check out our Discord to chat with us and hang out. And check out our Patreon to support us and get some cool extra stuff that we've got in the works. Some great stuff coming up there. Yeah, we, um, we've we got... Uh... Discord is really is, is is really the primary spot for everyone. If you all want to come and watch us hobby on Friday nights, we do that on Friday nights. Every we Friday night. which we are Great looking stuff. to um, stream in a more public way. Uh, we just in have... fact, by the time this comes out, we may already be doing that. There you go. Look at that. So, so... this may be moot. It may not be. Um, but yeah, that's really the best place for us for for you guys to. To, to get involved and see what's happening behind the scenes, all the work in progress stuff, all sorts of bits and pieces get spoken and talked about there. Memes galore. It's hilarious. Plenty of memes. Yeah. It's very funny. <laughs> um, it's great stuff. And Patreon's a great place to uh, to support us and help us out, as well as get some exclusive stuff like the pre game show, which as soon as Batraps are back, so will that. Um so will so will that be? So yes. <laughs> That's, it that's it will it, also be there. It will also be back. <laughs> <laughs> so so you can get some of that. Uh, and also, very shortly, um, we're going to make sure to have a an exclusive back wrap up mm. just for the patrons to say thank you for, for supporting us throughout the... Uh, through a throughout time the, of no content. <laughs> <laughs> throughout, throughout Nurgle's plague and blight on us down here in the land down under and yeah. everywhere else. Yeah. But uh, with that out of the way, what have you been working on, Lucky? Um, I have been working on a lot. Yeah. So I have finished a contemptor for the Death Guard, which very nice. Y'all would have seen posted. Um, up on the Instagram a couple of weeks ago. Yep. Yeah. Um, Strike Marines finishing up. Uh, Interceptors finishing up. Yeah. Um, currently building a converted Terminator. Sorcerer, which I, think I haven't seen this model yet, but it looks, it sounds like it's going to be looking fantastic. Dual lightning claw terminator with wings, mm. but obviously mm. he can't use the wings, but he's got wings. Because why wouldn't you have wings? Exactly. They're Nurgle, it's, like f- fly wings. That's amazing. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully that comes out really cool. Um, mm-hmm. I'll, I want to have that ready for a, um, I'm testing it anyway. So as a, as an idea, I think it's a better way to run instead of the malignant playcaster. Call me crazy, Death Guard fans out there, but it's just a test. We'll see. And it might not work. To convert an epic model, exactly, and then it'll probably just sit on the shelf if it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And what about you, man? Um, I've also been quite busy. Been finishing off the the Drakari. They're all all done, wrapped, finished. Nice. Well, until I buy more models for them anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's always the way it goes. It's not going to be long. <laughs> nah. Um, and also, yeah, some Grey Knights. I've got um, a Dread Knight and a Dread Knight Grandmaster on, on the go. Working on some, some cool stuff there. I've got a con- bit, little bit of reposing for the for the Grandmaster happening. Give him a, a mega tactical rock. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> been working as well on some also some uh, some Interceptors for the Grey Knights. Got to smash those out. Yes. Um, for that will be the the first ep back I think it we will can... be and in fact by the time I think we've already mentioned it on the podcast before and by the time this goes up you'll be like uh, hopefully a week or two away depending on of course the way the COVID restrictions work out down here we've got Grey Knights and Drakari um, for the first step back it's going to be a a right old slobber knocker yeah it'll be the... <laughs> it'll be pretty good you should have done it in like a oh 
I yeah. imagine Dark Eldar are like those aristocratic style. That's how they talk, right? Like, because I think they're better. Yeah. Than it's like, oh, it's going to be so good there, Dolly. <laughs> but, you know, less pompous and more evil. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I just, I just, I, now all I'm imagining is like Skeletor with a British accent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yes. See? Yes. Yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, but that one and there's a bunch more Ferrox coming up so- very soon after that as well. Of course, um, of course, of course, of course. We will be endeavouring to keep up our regular cycle. Um, and as we said about, as I said previously, with transitioning um, live streams as well. You're going to get bat reps. You're going to have podcasts. You're going to have live streaming of hobby. It's everything. Infinity. Well, I mean, 40K. do we want to outli- outline this this quickly as to what we're actually going to be doing? Um, okay. We'll have we'll have we'll have the podcast coming out every week, just yep. as it has been. Mm-hmm. Um, we're we're loving doing it, and we're, we're keen to keep it going. Yeah. Uh, we'll have battle reports coming out every other week, mm-hmm. um, as we were trying to get going before all this <laughs> sort of happened. Um, battle reports coming out every other week. The battle reports, of course, will then have a commensurate pregame show um, up for the patrons a few days in advance. Yes. And, and what we'll and talk about what lists is, and strategy yeah, I was gonna and say, tactics. What, what is that? Um, yeah, we, we break down what lists we're bringing. We talk about um, how we think the game's going to go. You know, what what mission we'll be playing and, and how we're going to play into that. Um, and that'll be more, I guess, almost more of a coaching side of things, as well as just us trying to, to learn about it and, and think things through ourselves. Because neither of us are, are top tier players uh, at this point. We're we're just trying to trying to get into it and really push ourselves. Yeah, and even from the from the uh, the idea of like, say for example, if we we do an app where we are running, say someone's list, you know, that's done well at something, or um, there's something that's new or something weird and janky that we want to test. I know that um, I've been testing a whole lot of weird lists, tuned lists on TTS lately, and yep. um, potentially building up towards one of them. So. It's just an avenue for us to, and the patrons to see, it's more of a real deep dive to list specifics, like why things were constructed, what we feel that the synergies are going to do and the game plan behind that, you know, and it's okay, yeah. like even if it, you know, because you say you shouldn't tell your opponent what you're doing or whatever, but it's more of a, you know, your opponent and dice and everything can change how things happen, yeah. so it's not really going to affect the game too much. Yeah, and I mean, again, we're we're coming to the table as as mates trying to play a game. We're not we're not coming to it as as hardcore competitors. And and it, when we get around to doing our hardcore competitive games, we'll probably adjust the way we do the pregame show as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, and in addition to the pregame show, which is we'll be up there for patrons uh, for everyone. We're doing hobby streams, which again may have already started by now. Mm. Every Friday night on uh, on YouTube Live, and they'll be be up there for you to to watch, where we just you know, talk smack and, and paint minis and uh, just have a grand old time. And that's, um, um, sorry, Friday AEST. AEST? Is that the time? AES, Austra- AEST, Australian Eastern Standard time. time. There you go. So if you're not... Whenever that is for, for, for everyone you, else, yes. good luck. <laughs> 7.30, around seven, between 7.30 and 8 o'clock is normally when we do it. Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah, another reason why to be part of the Discord, because if you're on the Discord, you jump in the chat, you can jump in the, even jump in and come say what's up, you know, even on, yeah. on the stream. So um, you can watch yeah, it absolutely. live, you can yeah. not watch it live, or you can come participate. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, I think that pretty much sums up what's going on, what we've got set. Um, we've got a few other plans that we're not going to bring up too much of just yet, but plenty of Infinity stuff coming, plenty of 40k lore stuff. Um yeah, we're we're busy. We're we're real busy with stuff, and I'm I'm super excited. Yeah, it's we're yeah. very 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 busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But one of the things that I've been doing, even while busy, is listening to a few audio books, mm. um, which has been good. Uh, mainly 40k stuff because let's be honest, what else am you listening to? Harry Potter. Um, well, yeah. I know, I know you you've been. <laughs> That's what it. I've been listening to. <laughs> Welcome to episode 10 of the Risky Old Podcast. <laughs> we talk about Harry Potter, Potter for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, look. The books get good after four. I'm just going to say. Yeah, but it's like four books in. 
yeah, I, I, it's it, look, it's still good. It's a pretty immersive world. Anyway, we're not here to talk about Harry Potter. Um, <laughs> and then, I, look, I've just started Warhawk. For those of you yes. who, who aren't aware, that is the sixth book. Yes, sixth book of the Siege of Terror series. It is indeed, which is the, the, the culmination of the Horus Heresy series. Mm. The finalization of the death of the Emperor. Sorry, the internment. Like... In, internment? In, 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 internment? Uh, yes, internment, internment yeah. of him on the throne. Which I'm oh. I'm super excited about. Like, look, I'm not going to get into spoilers, obviously, because it is just very recent. I'm not going to talk about it. But what I'm really excited with reading this whole series, just quickly, first, in my opinion, first two books are great. Third one is at Ur, and four, five, and four and five are, are, re- are really, really cool. Four and five are Ooh. like amazing. We'll come back to that because I, I disagree. I think the third one's a fantastic starting point. But go the, on. The third wall. Well, the, the third book. Yeah, the first wall or whatever it's called. No. Oh, you mean of the Siege of Terror? I of thought you were talking about the Horus Heresy no, as a whole. No, the third book oh, okay. of, the sea of, of Horus Heresy is oh. amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Fair enough. No, no, no. Of siege, siege of Terror, yeah, of I haven't got to yet. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, what I was just going to say quickly is that, um, you know, we know stuff that happens. You know, yeah. you know we know that Malkador gets well, interred on the throne. Well, we know it all from from 40k's perspective where a lot of it's apocryphal you mean like it's not uh canon so to speak no it's not no it's it's canon as that's what people in 40k think happened yeah but it's we don't necessarily know like he is exactly what happened no i know that and that's that's my point right it's like we know that okay malkador goes on the throne and um to give the emperor a chance so he can go and fight you know and, you know, each book, you know, it's getting more and more epic and closer and closer and da 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 whatever, whatever. We, you know, that's no spoilers. But the specifics of how that happens, like, does he... How 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 is the conversation happen between the Emperor and him? Is there a conversation between Valdor and him? Because, you know, Valdor and Malkador and the Emperor have this kind of... Uh, they're, the, they're the Holy Trinity, right? It's the... That's the whole um, metaphor. Mm. Um, is that... Uh, the Emperor's what is it? God Malkador's the Holy Spirit and the other one's the the other one. Sun. The, yeah, the sun, right? That, that the that's sun, yeah. the the whole concept. That's that's what it's, it's built off. Yeah. Um and you know, they have they always draw this throughout even throughout the Horus Heresy books, they always draw back to this whole different level of relationship between one, the custodians, but also between the Emperor and Constantine Valdor and Malkador. They have this weird bond. Yeah. So I hope they kind of explore that. And maybe they won't in too much because they just don't have enough time. Uh, essentially, there could just be a whole book. I mean, there is a book on Valdor, which is great as well. There's really, really good insight into um, the history of, of how the Imperium came to be and Emperor's rise and stuff. Um, but yeah, you know, those, those little things, like how the battle of On the Vengeful Spirit happens. You know, um, battle mm. between Sanguinius and, and Horus um, oh, that, that, that's going to be so epic uh, it's just scary because you kind of like look so far they've done really well yeah. like, personally yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they've done really well with it and because um, I think Forge the Narrative is another podcast out there an American one that they speak to um, I don't know if it's their podcast but someone speaks to Dan Abnett directly and asks him questions and it literally was the six or seven writers or the six six writers or whatever or four or five writers that are part of this series when Games Workshop was like this is what we're going to do it was literally all the book it was a it was a Marvel they got the Marvel treatment right yeah. all the books were planned um, you know conceptually and yeah, yeah. Um, the somewhat the story arcs were somewhat planned and all these kinds of things and that is really cool that's like a, when you hear those kinds of things you go oh, it's probably so going to be it's probably going to be someone great. knows what's going on Someone's yeah. got this under control. Yeah, yeah, someone's got their their finger on the pulse, sort of thing. Um, and you know, you, you're seeing it in the product. Personally, I think, um, I think yes. it's, it's it's really good for anyone out there who. Now, you think you should read the Horus Heresy before you read this, don't you? Well, I mean, I mean, I think it's it's perfectly valid to start with Siege of Terror if that's the way you're you're so inclined. Um, personally, I'm like, no, I I have to to read the whole series. I I can't start halfway through. Okay. Starting with Siege of Terror for me would feel like, 
like um, like picking up the fourth book in the Harry Potter series without reading the first three. Yeah, I I <laughs> like, think th- th- that's the way I'd I'd go into it. So there's which, what? How many books? It's annoying there? because there's sixty something books at this yeah. point. So and this is what I was going like, to say. Yeah. From from my experience of what I've read of the Horus Heresy, and then now having been up pretty much been up to date with Siege of Terror, there are some you should read. There's some you don't need to. Right, so far, yeah. you do not need to know anything about the Word Bearers or the Ultramarines or the Dark Angels because they're not there. Yeah. So that you know, in terms of if you're looking at um, plausible backstory, you, I mean, I, they're I not disagree. mentioned. I, I disagree about the word bearers and specifically Erebus. They're not there. Because he's the reason that that all happens. Yeah, I guess. Um, but literally after book three, he only really plays a role in three other books. And then everything else doesn't really have anything to do with them. Whatsoever. Yeah. So it's yeah. not as... Um, I think it's, it's, it's... Yes, it's important to know where the whole story arc has come from, 100%. But in terms of like, if you were going to go, oh, all right, what are what are the base books that I really need to hundred percent read mm. um, regarding? Because there are certain things, especially with like Jagatai and and um, um, uh, Malkador and the Grey Knight stuff. There is like things in those books that throughout the Horus Heresy are directly referenced in the Siege of Terror. Yeah. So like if you didn't know at least a passing concept, even if you were just to read the cliff notes of them, maybe potentially yeah. if you were to listen to a TLDR, Risky Rose, TLDR, maybe. <laughs> um, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, to get a, a uh, what is it called? The Cliff Notes plot synopsis, yeah, kind of like an overview, notes, like yeah. a summary, of it. <clears throat> a summary of it. Even if it was to do that, like for, especially, especially the you know the two White Skies books are really important. Yeah. Buried Dagger is really important, um, yeah, uh, because it, it one because it's literally the last book that that segues into the Siege of Terror, but also um, yeah. from a perspective of Typhus and Mortarian, it kind yeah. of it's a really good backstory there. Because that's that's the whole thing is they're never really mutated and, and chaosified until right then pretty much like they're kind of no one's seen them no you know one's seen them for no one's most seen of them the heresy for ages and then they just rock up and, and then everyone's just there like, and they're horrendous the, what the hell is going on they're like who are yeah. these guys even like the other demon primarchs are like whoa <laughs> yeah like that's, Dude, that's, that's, crazy. that's messed up like, yeah <laughs> um, um and i mean look f- from a from the perspective of someone who's who's new to the whole thing, maybe they're even new to 40k as a whole, uh, and they're like, "Oh, I want to, I want to know what happened and, and and all this." It makes sense not to go here, read these 60 books, and then get to the good stuff. Mm. Like it, it makes sense to go. All right, look, the Siege of Terror kind of stands on its own. Start here, read this, and then if you liked that, then go back and pick out the ones you liked from, you know, the first 50. Well, I reckon even what you could do a better way of doing it is is kind of go literally start at the beginning do your first three or yeah. at least you know as you say just the third one of oh well i don't say just the third one i say start with the third sorry one. start with the third one which is yeah. um galaxy and flames right no yeah. uh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Galaxy, galaxy and flames. And in, in fact i i almost say galaxy and flames is where i would start someone new to the entire universe almost yeah and depending then, on the person i'd say read this first and that's the thing it's like if you can like how they're written, and if you like Galaxy and Flames, then fine, go read Horus Rising and yep. whatever the Hor- other Horus Rising and False Gods are great False books. Gods, yeah, False Gods. False Gods is very is very dense. Unless you're already into it, you're probably going to struggle with False Gods. Yeah, I, I it's, found... It's good. I, I agree, I agree. But, yeah. And so I, that's why, that's why I, I will always advocate start with the third one, Galaxy and Flames. That's, in my opinion, the best introduction point to the Horus Heresy. Mm. The reason being is that it's written... It reads quite easily. It's written... It flows very well. It's written in a very... Um, oh, what's the term for it? The yeah. narrative voice is very easy to listen to. Yes. Essentially. It's written in a, in a very easy sort of tone. Yeah. So you, so you can get into that and you can read it and you can... It's not Charles Dickens. Enough... We're not trying to read hard times. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's enough about the characters that you can understand all their relationships and where they fit in with each other just in that book. There's definitely more depth to them, and you can get all get to all that later. But there's enough in that book that you understand it all. You don't read it and go, 
Where did this character come from? And how do they know this person? It's all in there. Yeah. Um, and then you, you know, spoiler alert, there's, you know, half, half the, half the, the Space Marine Legions turn on the other half. Um, what? And, but, no. Yeah. Shocker. <laughs> um, but you get to see the first open betrayal in mm. Galaxy in Flames. Um, and I genuinely, I sit here and I, I still read that and it's still, like I've read it plenty of times by, by now. I still spend the first half of the book hoping that it won't happen. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, but, but I, I do the yeah. same thing, man. Like the whole story, the whole Loken story arc is, and again, there are, I reckon there are these groups that are really important. And again, I, know, yeah. I, I don't want to tangent it away from it, but like Loken's story arc is really reflective in the Knights Errant books, which is all about the birth of the Grey Knights. So anyone yeah. who's if any if there's any Grey Knight fans out there and they go oh what are good Grey Knight books, start with Garrow firstly. Um, well, I mean, sorry, I really Flight of the Eyes start, of Zone. Start with start Flight of the with, Eyes, which means you need to start with Galaxy in Flames again. Yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's right before Flight of the Eyes. Yeah, so you need you need uh, Galaxy in um, Flames, then Flight of the Eyes of Stein. Yeah. But then after that, you don't need to worry about anything. Then but you, but then, then if you want to know about Loken, then you've got to go back and read Horus Rising and False Gods. Yeah, and personally, like I, I think you should start with Horus Rising because it's a really, I find it's a really good introduction to the disconnect from humans to space marines. I find it that is. I find that it better is, yeah. because it's more done in the, um, in the non-combat sequences. It's done in terms of like how humans revere space marines in terms of like yeah. how the serfs deal with their armor, and, stuff, and you don't really get those kinds of. Um, communicate those scenes and those kinds of communications that happen they definitely do in other books but not as much in that um yeah. I mean, and I that's still, definitely one I of the things would... that i really loved about that book was just the the setting of the scene not so much that yeah. like nothing really happens it's 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 a very safe first book do you know what i mean like it's it's that it is. Um, but it's, it's for that exact reason that i'd say don't start with it yeah because nothing happens in it really yeah, no, nothing. Like, no, like not the, really. the last like two pages are super important for <laughs> why the rest of the thing happens, and that's it. But the rest of the book is more or less irrelevant. Y- yeah, yeah, kind of. Um, don't get me wrong; it's all mentioned and it all builds the characters. And I, I mean, sorry, I finished rereading Horus Rising today, before before this podcast. Mm. Um, again, it's a it's a really great book. Mm. Uh, again, yeah, um, but I still reckon Galaxy and Flames is where you start. You start with that one, you feel the betrayal and the full heresy, and then you go back and you read Horus Rising and False Gods. Yeah. And, put, and there's yeah. this sense of inevitable dread that's built into them. You already know what's going to happen when when they turn they kill Loken, or almost kill Loken. Um, you already know that half the people in this are going to die, betrayed horribly by people they, they, they trust and the relationships they build in, in the first two books. And it's, there's this inevitable dread that builds throughout the whole thing where any time when it starts to, to get to something, you think, oh, this could fix it. In the back of your mind, you're going, something horrible is about to happen. Mm, yeah, of course. Um, and I, I genuinely think it, it improves the two books quite a lot, having that context already. Mm. Um, because otherwise they are quite quite dry. But it gives you it gives you reason, it gives you drive to, to know, to, to want to know why all these characters are connected and how they fit together. And then the the story, particularly of, of Loken's relationship with the other Mournival, is just that much more tragic mm. because you already know how it's going to end. Yeah, I mean, personally, I find it the other way around. Like, I find it more impacting when you have the build that leads to that point. And also, mm. um, it creates good tension. Yes, it's over three books and maybe not everyone has the ability to, to go through that process. But then, yeah. and, and the relationships, especially with some of the ones that you don't kind of don't expect to turn... Um, or the ones that you ex- don't expect to shift in certain ways, um, h- how the, those characters, when that happens. Um, yeah. But anyway, the point is is that start with the first three in whatever yeah. order you want to. I still think that is really the best place to start. I mean, don't start with number two. Don't start with first <laughs> Okay, yeah, don't I, 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 that, that, that's, that's not where you want to start. Um, <laughs> and then after that, I think it depends on... And this is the advice I got was like... Hmm. read the first three and then whatever faction you like the most start there so yeah. if you're a world eaters person go read betrayal 
if you're a which white... Which is book like 30-something. Yeah, doesn't matter what number. If you're a white yeah. Scars person, and even if you're not, even if you like Space Marines in general, I recommend everyone should read Scar and uh, Path of Heaven. I reckon they are in like the top five books of those. They're just... They're so I mean, good. If, if you're not a fan of Space Marines, you're going to struggle with the series. Well, yeah, if you're Let's not a fan idea. of Space Marines, then you probably shouldn't be. I mean, if you're not a fan of Space Marines, start with Mechanicum. Go to book nine. Yeah, or... um. It's good. Or, um... Oh, uh, it. No. What's the... Uh, Vulcan lives. Yeah. Because it's yeah. hating on Space Marines both ways. <laughs> <laughs> Kerr's, yeah. hating, Kerr's hating himself, and then Kerr's hating... Falcon. So, um, and yeah. So, and then, and then, hmm. either follow the faction you want to, and then, i.e., again, if you're into Grey Knights, um, yeah, the Garrow series, which I'm pretty sure now a lot of them, um, the Knights Errant series is actually condensed into one book now. Both. I think there's a volume. Yeah, like it's a, it's a. I think it's just called Garrow now. Which no, because Garrow Garrow is one of the books. Uh, yeah, but there is like an omnibus. I don't know if it's in print. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. an audiobook. Um, where it's literally yeah, sorry, the Garrow book and then the three other Knight Errant stories. Which links yeah. in Loken and it links in Yeah, you know, Garrow be a, a potentially, you know, being the first Inquisitional Knight. Precursor yeah. to Grey Knights, whatever you want to call it. Anyway. Um mm. you know, I think pretty much you can gloss over anything that is anthological that is not um, specifically focused on one key thing, i.e. the Primark ones. Um, mm. uh, With the exception being, I would say, the first anthology book, which I've momentarily forgotten the name of. Um, they just don't massively contribute to anything that you're... Mo- like, you don't lose out by not reading it. Um, I, in terms of I'm the, say the first story. one you do. Which one's because that the one? Because first, the first one is... Uh, I'm trying to remember what, what the book was called. Um, it was released in... What? 2005 or something? I'm not going to remember something, that. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> um, but the, the, the point was, is it contains the short story, The Last Church. It, conta- um, it contains which, the what, sorry? The short story, um, The Last Church by Graham McNeil. This, this was in the first, um, the first anthology novel. Tales of Heresy, that's the one. Like book eight or something. No, uh, but specific. Can't no? be book eight. It's pretty early in the series. It must be towards the end. Does the anthological stuff come out way later? No, no, no. It, it's um. No, it, it, it's pretty early. It was t- tenth volume. It's number ten, book ten. Ah. Tales of Heresy. Um, and there's a bunch of stories in it, but specifically the last church mm. sets up. Uh, sets up so much of the Emperor's like in, in, in just a short story sets up so much of the Emperor's hubris Hi- hypocrisy and hypocrisy <laughs> so perfectly um, that it's 100% worth reading w- w- at least worth reading that short story or watching the um, the animated version yeah which is also excellent and that stuff is definitely and it's definitely not available on YouTube under a quick search it definitely hasn't been re-uploaded there <laughs> and there's no possible chance that anyone could watch that for free at all they definitely don't just need to type in the last church animation into youtube and it definitely will not be like the first or second result and you definitely shouldn't watch it <coughs> watch it um you know yeah. so <laughs> uh yeah i mean equally i don't know I, I personally i still think that doesn't necessarily contribute to it's a deeper part to the overarching story like his motivations is you know because the emperor's just kept as this cryptic person the whole way through right you never yeah. actually hear from him him specifically speaking mm-hmm. except in the master very, of, very short occasions yeah and then like in passing and it's never anything major except for the master of mankind he's kind of a, a mm-hmm. big one in that one um yeah. and then obviously valdor but all these things that's covered in in um the subjects and contextual stuff that's covered in the last church is also covered in Saturnine and also is built towards this whole. True. Um, I mean, I and haven't read the Siege of Terror books well, yet because yeah. I'm, I'm not up to them. Um, the I'm Valdor book, I reckon, does it again. even better, to but, be honest. Okay. Well, I mean, there you go. In that but, case, read Valdor instead. Yeah. Um, um, I, I'm purely talking about the ones that I, I've read, so I know 
what's in them already. I'm like that that's such a fundamental basis for the Emperor's character throughout the rest of the series. Yeah. As far as I'm aware. But if Valdor does it better, then then go there. And that's so you're gonna get more out of that. Yeah, um that one also is not a Horus Heresy book. That is a um, Oh, okay. No, no, so that's a post it's got nothing to do with that series. It's literally just about Constantine Valdor and the birth of the Imperium. Right. Really, 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 really good. I've, I've heard good things about that. Are, are there, is it part of like a, a trilogy of, of no, stuff? it's just called Valdor, Birth of the Imperium. Right. Um, it's titled with a uh, colon, so implying that there may be a Valdor colon something else. Which would be really cool. Yeah, well, see, I was under the impression that that meshed in with a couple of other stories that made that were important with regards to what the Eldar were doing and something to do with um, pariahs and the Pariah Temple. Oh no, that, or, or uh, that's Pariah and Penitent series of the Ravnica right. series. No, completely. Gotcha. Different. gotcha. Yeah, completely. Okay. Different. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that because that's that's mass spoiler territory. Yeah, yeah. But enough. also, there, read them; they're amazing. <laughs> There's a lot of different intersecting 40k stories that it's hard yeah. to keep track of sometimes. Especially now, which is actually one thing, it's actually cool that you said that, because I reckon that's one thing mm. that's really cool is what I like that they're doing, is they're... Yeah. Yes, you have this kind of generic storyline. I guess you, you you have kind of... You've had t- three main story arcs, right? You've had... Yep. Well, the ho- well, let's let's hear quickly from, from Tim from Dice Arcade, and then we'll be right back and we'll actually get right into, into this topic. Awesome. DiceArcade.com.au All the biggest brands of miniatures and wargaming Free postage over $250 Thanks Tim um, Yeah, so you, sorry, you were saying about the the way the current story is set up with all these different intersecting little storylines So into the bigger one Yeah, ultimately 40k is broken up into like three story story arcs, right? You've got Horus Heresy Which is almost like a like a prequel kind of historical type thing. Yeah. And then you've got um, up to 8th edition 40k, which is mainly, yeah. you know, this is where all your Black Legion books are and a lot of your Space Marine omnibuses. And look... Most of the books. Most of the books are just, you know, combat y bolter porny. Except, actually, except for a lot of the Xenos ones, like the Eldar stuff, they're stories that actually kind of... Path of the Eldar is a, is a pretty great cool, series because um, um, they can explore more. Well, they have explored more themes and stuff like that, bits yeah. and pieces. And then you have post Great Rift, or yeah. or or at time of into post Great Rift. Yeah, and I think where you see these interlacing stories is in this post Great Rift part. Um, and I mean, this is because because of the way that. Games Workshop and Black Library have changed their approach to the setting as a whole. Well, it's now with, it's, with Eighth Edition yeah. and and Ninth Edition, they're moving. It's a story, not a setting. It's, yeah, it's a story now. Well, I mean, it, it still is a setting, but I mean, so it, is, it has it's a, a main, story. It, it's a setting yeah. that now has a story. Which... Up, up to up to Eighth Edition, Forty K was like all the books in it were, were fantastic and so on, and they all tell self contained stories, but none of them could change could could majorly change or impact the way the wider setting functioned and fit together well because no one addressed... this, this was to facilitate yeah. the way that the game worked and you wanted models to work and be able to sell models and yeah. sell the same models for many years and, and keep characters around and, and just not have to worry about how that impacted an ongoing story and the way that basically worked was that uh, the story was in limbo because yeah. up until you know when 40k was released you'd had the 12th Black Crusade. So Ad- Abaddon had already done 12. And then the 13th came out in, I don't know, 3rd edition or whatever it was, 2nd edition. 3rd or 4th edition. Yeah, some of that, right? And then it was the big, the 13th, <laughs> and everyone was like... Oh, <laughs> they, they, they had a massive campaign and Chaos lost every battle. And nothing changed for like 25 yeah. years, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and look, that's fine. It's, fi- it's fine, but obviously, as they saw, which I'm really happy that they have, you get to a point where you go, there's so much here now that you can... And look... I think this is great. I love the fact that it, it there is a moving story within a mm. setting because of how vast the setting is. Yeah. The story can be endless. It doesn't have to so, end. I think it's worth acknowledging that it you do lose something when it comes to personalization and customization when you 
let the setting move. Um, in what regard? When it comes to when it comes to people doing their own armies and stuff, it can it can impact the way people look at that. A lot of people would have armies that are relevant to the way the story is moving, and they go, "Oh, well, now it doesn't make any sense." Yeah. That yeah, said, yeah. I mean, yes. Yeah, I think well, you, you're not wrong. You and I. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, look um, what you, you know, can create someone, now someone, with the great Someone rift. collecting an ultra. Well, that's what I was going to say. Is yeah. that regarding and, and I mean I'll uh, I'll very briefly um, touch on that as well regarding the way that having a moving story lets in the long run lets more individual stories be told mm. it lets people have more freedom to to create their own their own armies and their own you know the your dudes that 40k is all about yeah it gives it, it opens that up a lot more and I mean the the example that I'll, I'll bring up very quickly is my own imperial forces they're all tied in and around the Great Rift. Mm. And the fact that the story is progressing means I can progress my own forces and have them do different things. Yeah, well, so just... rather than having, these are my guard and they're set on this planet doing this thing. It's like, well, they've done three different things on three different planets by now. Well, it's the same thing with my, all... my Death Watch, yeah. right? My Death Watch is yeah. literally built around, it's actually built around the Emperor's Spears book. So in that section of space, it's there was a, a, a watch fortress in that period of, in that section of space in Alara's Vale, and that now because they're completely cut off from everything else, it, they only draw from the three main chapters of the a lot that's that are set up within the Alara's Vale, which is the Empress Spears, the Celestial Lions, and then the Green Scorpions or whatever. But they're pretty much dead, so it's only these two. Mm. That, that's the law that I've built around my Death Watch, and that's why they're different. They're painted white instead of black, and yada yada whatever. And right. because so having having a changing story opens up a lot more a lot more different a lot scenarios. of stuff like that a lot a lot of a lot more different uh, a lot of different scenarios for people to to experiment with and play with and, and do different things with and I think the key point in that is literally there's two things happening at once here you've got you've got the moving story i.e. Gilliman um, allies with the Eldari Abaddon. You know, um, breaking the gate. The, the, sorry, the rift. Um, sorry, not that. Um, Eisenhorn. Um, siege. Not the siege of terror. <laughs> um, uh, you got the fall of plague wars. The, great rift, you got the plague. The, the plague and the plague wars. Indominus Crusade. Sorry, that's what I was trying to think of. The Indominus Crusade. Yeah. The Indominus Crusade. Right. Took us a while to get there. They're the story parts, but the rift is the setting change. Yes. So the yes. Se- the setting now is and, just and Gilliman. And Gloomin's a big setting change as well. Well, just him, just him existing is a massive setting change. Yeah, yeah. Primarchs being alive in, in the forty first millennium again. Yes, yeah. is um, which I'm all for. Like, I'm all for bringing them all back. Obviously, not the ones that are dead. The ones that are dead, keep them dead. I.e., Ferris yeah, and Sanguinius, they're dead. Yeah, leave them dead, Horus. Stay dead. I he can. He can. I wouldn't be against. Sanguinius coming back in a spiritual level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, for example, like super powerful psychers or someone being able to connect to him somehow, which they kind of have. Um, They've kind of alluded to. They've alluded to, to that in, his, um, his in Blood soul of Baal. Being around somewhere. Yeah, the end of Blood which, of Baal. Which, which is something that does kind of make sense, like the Primarchs having. A different kind of soul to, to regular people, but I mean, we're, we're and just because in this one because of how strong he was and stuff, and um, yeah, yeah, and especially when with some of the new stuff that's come out, around, especially around God Blight and the um, mm. Penitent series, which is the the Beckwin, sorry, the Beckwin series, which is the third trilogy of the whole Eisenhorn Ravenna overarching story, um, mm-hmm. which is. Those the those eight books. I can't wait for the ninth one, but those eight books are so good. So like the the my opinion, the best trilogy in for in the Black Library is the Eisenhorn trilogy. It's so good. Dan Abner is just a weapon. He's, yeah. He writes such cool he's such cool stuff. Um But yeah, so again this this interlacing thing now is kind of again, it's 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 a little bit of the Marvel treatment, right? Not as much as, okay, we need to plan every book out, but they're now opening up to kind of looking at things with new lenses and going, well, this thing's now so vast, we can interlock them. And personally, I think it just creates a better storytelling. Yeah. As long as they don't get too Star Wars-y where everyone knows everyone else. 
Like there's, you know, an entire galaxy, only three people, three families involved. But um, then I think it's fantastic. Yeah, you as long as you avoid like that, that sort of thing going on, it just means that you can have all these stories weave in and out of one another. They can come and connect and, and interact and then they can leave again and go mm. and tell their own vastly different adventures and tales. And then maybe they cross paths with a different, a different storyline or a different set of characters. Mm. I mean, personally, uh, like I yeah. find that I like the... Um, and maybe this is... I think this is very real as to why I like the Eisenhorn series so much. I like the stuff that actually references people or government and like the kind yeah. of real in workings of how the Imperium would be. Like, I'd love to see a, um, um, like a story about, which it, there is one, it's to do with, um, oh, I can't remember his name. Uh, he's a cop. It's, he's a, oh, the, he's um, an R- the, the 40k crime series. Yeah. Series. Yeah. But he's, he's basically yeah. an Ar- Ar- Arbides officer or whatever, or, or, or a, um, PD. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of yeah. those, and he's basically like a cop, you know. I am the law. <laughs> yeah, judge pretty dread. much, right? The, 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 the not judge dreads. Yeah, and then it's just you know the connection between you know the, the whole concept of when you when you when you look at it from a space marine's eyes, you know, an inquisitor is just a throwaway title, right? It's just a throwaway name, or even mm. if you look at it from the Primarch level or whatever. But when you kind of, and this is what again, what I think is really uh, the power and the um, this which leads to the success of, of all three of all nine of um, Dan Abnett's books regarding the, the Eisenhorn, Ravener and, and Beckwin series is, is the the concept of a human who is just an inquisitor like what does that mean and how do, how do you show that power or well, the power is it, you know it's never there's one space marine in the whole like of um, mm. of the Eisenhorn series mainly it's just one chaos marine but the whole imagery of when they see this one chaos marine they like lose their mind literally to the point where one of his stuff's like involuntary throws up and just like loses her <laughs> shit because they just can't handle like seeing a twisted as shit like chaos space marine um yeah. <clears throat> that stuff's cool you know you that wow factor it really puts that sense of grandiose scale that 40k has into perspective, yeah. which you lose so much I, you, in Baltimore. You lose a bit of that when that, you're looking you know? at, at Space Marines or Custodians. And yeah. Stuff. You, you do lose a bit of that perspective. Mm. Another... I, I think that's one of the things that the Dark Imperium series does quite well is balance that out a fair bit. I mean, there's still a fair bit of Space Marine, Primaris, yada yada. But I think the best, the strongest parts of that series, as far as I've read it so far, are the bits where you're with the, the soldiers... The regular oh, yeah, that, yeah. Are, that are kicking around and they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're you know great. getting embroiled in in this this you know uh, noble invasion thing going on, um, and I mean some of the interactions between them and the the demonic powers is pretty cool. Bolus, yeah, yeah, Bolus, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bolus, and, and, the, and the in other the guy. in the uh, in the hospital, yeah, it's hectic. That yeah. whole that whole sequence, I would have loved to have. And the way I would have loved an entire book about that. Yeah, that's what I mean. If that and segment the way was that just they in talk about continuity, that would have been great. Yeah, and imagine like when they're when they're talking about the heretic Astartes, and like how the the Inqu- well, not the Inquisition, but the the higher ups are trying to like shut down any talk of it and trying to cover. Yeah, up the because they all. they don't want it to. Um... And then to talk about morale, and, and they don't yeah. know about it, sort of thing. And then the way they talked about like how like traumatizing and affecting it was just to see and know they existed, mm. let alone actually fight them well it's like an impossibility right it's like well it's the thing like yeah it's, it's like it's, walking it's into a, a room with non-euclidean geometry you your brain would just implode right because you, it's just um impossible <laughs> yeah and i mean like <laughs> and you've got all that there and then the other the other strongest part of it uh was again it's to do with perspective was probably gloomin's relationship with was it freda matthew freda matthew yeah that's um, those were the, all those conversations are my favorite parts of the entire book. Yeah. they were just so. And it's good. weird because you think, oh, forty k is all about warfare and sort of thing. And it's like, no, no, the, the you know, space marine shoots bolter, kills another, whatever. Right? You can read that in a hundred books doing whatever. It's all about those. That sense of perspective, and that sense of of personal, uh, personal involvement that you get from the human characters. Mm. Um, and look, and com- you learn more about the prime, the unbelievable godly Primarch Gulliman, from the way that this this human talks to him, than you do from any sort of description of, of his own perspective. Well, yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's the that's the point of the whole purpose of that part of hmm. the writing, right? And that's why I think it's it's done really well. Guy, really Guy well. Haley does it really well in terms of to show Gulliman's humanity and it. 
the, that, that whole trilogy, I mean, I guess maybe more the first two books, because the first two books definitely focus more on um, what Gilliman in, has in, was intending and what the therefore the Emperor intended the Space Marines to be. Yeah. And and then how their relationships to humans, the Ultramarines see that as, as an important thing, right? Yeah. The third book is more, obviously, very co- more so Death Guard slash... In- Ultramarines, uh, Mortarian, uh, yeah. Gilliman. That's kind of the focus of the third book, you know, which we're not going to get into. But um, that element is really, really cool. I, I find anyway. Again, I like the political stuff a lot. Mm. Uh, and and yeah. those two books actually, call me crazy, it actually made me kind of like the Ultramarines from, they, a, look, I mean, from a law point. As, <laughs> as heretical as it is to say it, kind of, yeah. <laughs> like... Yeah, like, like the fact that they are statesmen, the fact that they are um, like Felix, Decimus yeah, Felix. Mean, he's he's, he's probably he's kind probably of like oh, I do actually. Yeah, he's yeah. probably my favorite. Um, he's probably my favorite uh, loyalist space marine. Really? Yeah, I think because I've read the Belisarius Call book, and he's uh, and he's okay. pretty much the protagonist in that, and it's really cool. See, I'm only I'm only a few chapters into the great work so far. Um, and it's weird, uh, that book should not be called what that book's called. It should be titled completely different. It should be called, like, The right. Fall of Sotha or or mm. something to do with Felix because, like, yes, calls there and there's some climatic points with him and what he does, but the book... It's hard because without spoiling it, I can't really justify why I think it should not be called that without spoiling it. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I mean, read on, it. On and... a very quick side note about Call, the Call Inferior is a phenomenal character, and like I'm, I, so I'm, I'm. It's just a really about to great concept. Dark Imperium. Yeah. Uh, and but start start going through Plague War. Yeah. And I really hope that Call Inferior like sticks around and is like a. I, I can see that there's so much potential there. Have you all right without without giving spoilers can, can to the to the listeners? Ha, mm. ha, have you gotten to the point when in in Call the Great Work? When Call is told what the Call Inferior says to Gilliman? No, I haven't. I okay, haven't yet. wait till you I, get I'm, to I'm, that because yeah, that makes yeah. that whole concept you're talking about even more interesting. Oh, okay. Now, now I'm just going to go back and, and keep going through that one because yeah, yeah, and you're like this, and I'm you. You need to listen to that book because the end yeah. is right up your speed. Yeah, uh, right. for other reasons. <laughs> um, it's it's a good book. It's again Guy Haley. Um, and yeah. it, you know, it, it, if you've, if you've read the, um, the, uh, what, what's it called? I've got it right here. The Dawn of Fire series, which is kind of, it's like Avenging Sun and, and the ones after that. It's okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's pretty subpar compared to what else is, is currently being written. Um, are they, are they better or worse than like the Indomitus book oh way better I was like, yeah, well, uh, oh okay all right well all right but still not great compared to say dark imperium or like some horus right. heresy stuff but okay there are some key characters like um mm. alpha primus right so for those yeah. of you who don't know in the law which i'm really bummed that you can't get this model for admec um call has this essentially the first primaris that he made um called the alpha primus and he's like calls per calls personal bodyguard and he, not spoilers, but like real talk, he's essentially Cole's attempt at making a Primarch, which went wrong. Um, mm. He is essentially just a souped up, crazy, psychic Primaris Marine. But mm. there's this kind of um, tug of war battle. And all the Primaris have this. And again, this is shown in a few of the books that they have against Cole because they're like, you touched us for 10,000 years and that's all the memories they have. Yeah. It's being like cut open and tortured by this dude. <laughs> but they're like you also made gene coded to like and, not yeah. ha- hate him. And um, <laughs> there's some really cool interactions in the Dawn of Fire series to do with that character. And again, um, Decimus, mm. Felix and um, the... Uh, um, the key components that um, Gilliman lays out for his Dominus Crusade and stuff. Um, yeah. The whole concept with the Tetrarchy and that, I loved that scene. 
in the mm. Dark Imperium books in Plague War when um, mm. he he goes to Ultramar and he goes to McCrag and poor Kalgar like he's done everything pretty good so far and just comes in and just cracks the shits because they're like you guys have lost all this <laughs> yeah. there's no yeah. longer it's not 500 <laughs> worlds anymore it's like 300 it's like 30 and, <laughs> yeah, it's like 300 and something or whatever or 100 and something well like. I mean even even back in Dark Imperium he's like he's just He's annoyed about this because he's trying to find just a map that someone has. No one has like a map of the five hundred worlds. They don't exist anymore. Yeah. And no one, like, and well, there's no one else. That I mean, I remember. Either. I remember which ones they all were. So he's trying to find a map that just shows them all, so he can be like, "These are all the ones." Yeah. And he's trying to put together his own star charts and stuff for it. Like it's yeah. So the amount of the the amount of stuff that he's lost, a Gulliman has lost since when he was there. And just him trying to rebuild that and struggling with, with you know, what it means to, to rebuild it and whether that's something that he should be doing even. Or even uh, if it's is possible. It, well, yeah, even if it's possible. He, that's one of the most compelling bits of that whole that whole story and his character. I mean, I think it makes him a much more interesting character now than in the heresy. <laughs> let's, let's be real here. He's not... Well, exactly I mean, he's not really that. in it. Again, it's like, it's two books. Yeah, yeah. And that's really it. Like you, you're 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 told of him through others. Yeah. All you hear is, "Oh, Gulliman's great. Gulliman's the yeah. He's the Gulliman's poster there. boy. He's you know he was he yeah. he was always by the emperor's side, whatever. And I think that's a so, good so having thing. Having him transplanted into well, I, th- I think so because like it means that you you can have him uh, at least for the moment kind of not fleshed out too much. And it still so makes when you're sense. writing the current 40k story, yeah, yeah. you're not like you know, over you're not overwriting previous law. Well, it's still believable at that point where you're like, you're exactly, not sitting yeah. there going, um, this is not how this dude would respond to this situation. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Which is a problem, which is why, you know, when the whole topic comes off, like, which Primark would come back next? You're like, it's not going to be the lion. It's not going to be these Lehman Russ. It's not going to be these people that would just come back and slaughter everyone. Like, you know, if they came yeah. back and saw the fact that, you know, the entire of the Imperium worships him like a god. You don't think they would lose their shit and be like, um, I'm going to now murder all you people because you guys are fucked. This is what we fought against. Like, you know, mm. the, the the irrationality of them, you know, and from a story point of view, maybe that's something that GW does want to do because it can lead to, you know, heresy 2.0. Um, uh, yeah. But, I mean, it, it's, it's an, <clears throat> certainly an interesting direction they could take do another big civil war event kind of thing. They can do it better than like one of the big dum dums, though, right? Yeah, yeah. I think they, they could do can. one of the smarter ones and kind of. Personally, mm-hmm. I think if there if there is a loyalist that comes back, it has to be Jagatai. It's the one that fits most in the setting of current Imperium. See, I, I've heard you talk about Jagatai and, and the Scars books, and I've just. I've got no point of reference for it. So I'm, I'm really excited to get to the White Scar books in, this, in the Horus Heresy series. He, um, because I'm like, you, I, I hear you talking about how cool they are and I'm like, I have zero points of reference for this. I think, <laughs> I think <laughs> the reason why I find them so cool is is they, they, they're obviously drawn from like w- w- wise shamans, right? It's yeah. a great sense of honour. Particularly like the, the, the Mon- Mongols. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's also um, just indigenous hmm. Uh, like I think there's some like Native American stuff in that as well. Um, in terms they're, they're, of they're the, the the noble savage archetype. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's 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 the that's the, the concept. Um, but in terms of super wise and bright and just it's that um, Dalai Lama style of approach. It's very wise. It's very thought out. But there's this kind of tact intelligence to it as well mm. um even to how he communicates in as in this um Jagatai in general but then there's also this like ferocity and then there's this fight against the bullshit against you know i you know he doesn't just do what he's told because his brothers tell them like he respects their power and he respects them but he's like you cool bro you do you i'm gonna yeah. go do me my own way <laughs> Like, no disrespect, like, genuinely, like, I'm, you know, not doing an anger on here going, you know, oh, I'm going to storm off and be a little bitch. But, no, it's like, no, no, cool, I'm going to do it my way, and then we'll just meet back up and we'll talk about it. Like, that's, that's generally his kind of outlook on, on all stuff, and I respect that, like, even just from a, 
from a human being person like now living in the real world like you know you respect mm. people for being that way and i think that's just maybe maybe it's the most modern non stereotypical character maybe maybe that's why i like it so much i don't know um and then just the the connections that they have with their serfs and stuff and how they integrate them it's very similar to um uh the relationship the blood angels have with their serfs and stuff there is this like really close connection you know b- before they started drinking with their blood yeah sort of eating off. them yeah. um <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i guess uh, ultra uh, the ultramarines as well they have this really strong yeah. connection with the the people that work their ships and the indoctrination that they have and all these bits and pieces i mean i like i love it the, <laughs> the first thing jagatai does when he gets taken to terror and he gets given all these ships and he's like the emperor's like go kill stuff he's like cool i want my ships to be faster <laughs> he, he straight up tells like all 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 the um the um what are they called what's the admin called the the mechanicum adepts yeah but um yeah the me- yeah the, the tech priests tech priests he's like make this this much faster they're like we can't do that he's he goes no you're gonna do it like these are the figures I don't care I want it done in this like ridiculous time frame and they're like we can't I'm like well you want to tell the emperor that I'm not leaving and they're like oh yeah sorry we'll do it like, yeah shut up go go make because you know it's it's all the the the, the, the their, mount, their mountain men you know they're, ho- they're horsemen the, they, they want to have mm, the yeah. the wind in their hair as they ride with their talwas riding and you know so that's very much the philosophy is taken from that and put into like uh, into void combat and stuff. And I think I like that as well. There's, there's these really cool connections to the culture of where they come from, i.e. not only in real life, but in, 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 um, in universe uh, of what it's like on Jagoras and all that stuff. And that is literally transposed into how they are as space Marines. And I don't really think you get that much with the other ones. You get it with Ultramarines and the Statesmen again, which are one of those things I think is quite, strong and good um but in mm. terms of okay maybe maybe death guard a bit you know yeah the world not very eaters. long though yeah and then like the world eaters it's just there's no culture there right it's just it's just yeah. bar- barbaric gladiators and um i mean it, it's interesting because like the the world eaters you've got betrayer which is one of my favorite heresy books i've read hmm but then you're, it's, like, it's not really about the world eaters. It's about Khan. It's about, yeah, it's literally about Khan. And, and fucking uh, Erebus. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. I mean, I, yeah, I, earlier today I like I sent you a message with just me complaining. Yeah, about, it was random. Yeah, it was a voice message Erebus. just going, fucking Erebus. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, is, is there new well, lore? Fi- is there I new lore? Finished... Did I miss it? No, no. It's like, what did we meet up in? I just finished Horus Rising. And I was just like, there was genuine anger there. <laughs> like, I've got to do, I've got to say something. Um, and look, you know, that book also explores the word bearers so much more. Yeah. I mean, I, Betrayer is more of a word bearers book than a world leader's book. Yeah. It's actually more of a like Lorgar book Khan, than anything. It's Khan, it's Khan and Argletail and the word bearers. And, and Lorgar, yeah. And that book actually made me like Lorgar. And yeah. From, from, yeah. A, from a perspective of the, aside from the other two, um, even Angron, like it, it, it makes it works for Angron, which is, Man, is hard to do. That scene, given. that scene when Angron saves him. So, I uh, look, the book's been out yes, the for fifteen yes. years, yeah. So we're spoiling it. Um, there's a scene where Lorgar is. Spoiler alert! Angron saves Lorgar. Whoop de do. No, but it's how Lorgar is about to get it, crushed yeah. by the foot of a titan, a warhound titan. Yep. And- <laughs> And then Angron <laughs> dives in under it and is like full on. Just catches it. Oh, Hercules <laughs> moment, like bang. Like Atlas. Yeah. Just it, like it, staunch. I think they, they, even, they even describe it like Atlas of old or something like you that. You imagine every single muscle and vein just like full Arnie, just popping. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's sitting there and oh, mind you, um, Lorgar's unconscious, right? So he's screaming yeah. at him to wake up. It's like, bro. yeah. yeah. Wake up and then he get out of here. and then he wakes up and gets and he's like I can't hold this. It's just epic. It's ridiculous. It, it is, it and is. I love that. And and that's one thing that I think is really cool is when you, you know, again what we were talking earlier about the, uh, the, the contrasting nature of things when they're written to give power to something, right? So like the, Inqui- the Inquisition, yeah. the Inquisitors, you get power. This gives that that power on that scale. So it's the same concept just scaled up, right? So like, 
Primarchs mm. are all powerful. Oh yeah, it's a passing word. Well, oh well, a Titan tried tried to squish him, and it didn't. Yeah. And you're like, holy <laughs> shit! You know. Um, so yeah, that that's mm. definitely a recommended book. That book's great. I mean, yeah. look, literally. I mean, we could. But, but I mean, the, the point the point that we we're originally getting to was that the word the world leaders. Unfortunately, there's not like a lot there to work. With. No, yeah, there's, and um, there is. I, I like I like that they exist as as what they are, which is this counterpoint of just the un, unbridled violence of Astartes. I mean, look, there is but, a book about him, Angron, the um, which is part of the, yes, the yeah. Primarch um, series, the yep. Primarch Horus Heresy series. Which I think it's, it's worth stating if anyone's not sure. The Horus Heresy is like essentially like three series. You've got the Horus Heresy, the main collection, like the main series. Then you've got the Siege of Terror, which is like the end bit. Um, but then you've also got the Primarchs, which is classed as a separate series, and it's currently nine books that is just detailing information about specific Primarchs. Yeah, so mm. it's kind of the Primark book books are not necessarily um, origin stories; they're more of a... defining stories. Yeah, some trope, some reason as to how they've gotten a certain way or they are a certain way is built from. So, for example, Vulcan's story is about him getting the trust and love of his legion when he gets them. Because when they first, mm. when he first gets there, they're like, "Who's this dude? Meh, whatever." Yeah. <laughs> so it's about that. Um, yeah. So and they're all, they most of them, most of the ones that I've read, which is the Vulcan one, the Lehman Russ one, and the Jagatai one, mm. are great. Are really, really, really great. Um, the the other thing that is quite annoying when it comes to the world eaters is that there's so much to explore there and you see this in Betrayer you know the whole yeah. like, his story man it's it's it is super like it's it's tear jerking man it's super sad it, it is yeah it's like, it, it, it's I mean the horror series is a whole like as far as the, uh, the literary nature of it it's an epic tragedy yeah yeah it is for, 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 from a literary sense but then the world leaders and Khan and Angron's story in particular is is tragic in the more contemporary sense. And I think Khan, not uh, so much, because Khan now, yeah, okay, he's epic, but he still even now fights it, right? Like, he's still got it under control. Well, I think Khan is, Khan is, is um, the epitome of, like, the, the fallen hero. Yes. In, 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 this, in, this, in this structure. So, so like, a, like a real Darth Vader if he didn't all of a sudden just turn evil and come good. Yeah, yeah. Like there, there's much more to it than that. Um, but yeah, Angron and betray is really important for for how that happens too. Yeah, but Ang- and and you know also for Angron's fleshing out of just he is a dude who was born to fail, no matter what. Yeah. Like there's just and then you know these things kind of raise the questions of again which are brought up in later books of the current and I'm not going to spoil. But like, did he know? Like. Why would you create someone like Angron if you yeah. don't expect him to turn on you? Or, you know, mm. someone like Erebus and the paranoia of Perturabo that's, like, literally built into them. Um, yeah. And the poor, poor Kurz is just, like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> the secret holder of everyone with, like... Oh, man. It's... Uh, epic. The Vulcan Lives book is just again very similar to the uh, Betrayer thing. We get an insight into what it's actually like because it just for the Vulcan Lives story is about um, you finding out that Vulcan is a perpetual, i.e., we can't die. <laughs> yeah. Um, pretty pretty common knowledge by now. Yeah. Um, so that was there was actually the Emperor's plan was to make them all perpetuals, uh, but only Vulcan was the successful one. So. You find yeah. out also that the uh, um, Kurz, uh, after Isvan Five, Kip um, gets given Vulcan um, as a gift from Perturabo, and then he's held within the labyrinth, which is a prison built by Perturabo, um, because there was speculation that he could die and whatever they wanted to hold him but also because they didn't yeah. want him on the throne and because he's an amazing builder and the whole theory is that if he was there 
they would never have won. They knew that if Manus, if Ferris Manus and Vulcan were there with Dawn, there's no chance they would have won. Yeah, that's 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 a conversation that happens between Perturabo and Horus. There's no way they would have been able to win. So they had to systematically do that. And then Kurz was like, "Give him to me. I'll, I'll yeah, whatever." And then it's potentially like a um, sorry, it's essentially like a, um, a, a psychology session <laughs> between, <Yeah. laughs> between Vulcan and Kurz. Where Kurz, there's, it, there's this really interesting reversal in it too. Oh, massive! Where, where oh, yeah. Kurz ends up going insane because he can't kill him. And it's yeah, like <laughs> horrific. But you really, really um, see how twisted he is and why he's twisted, and it's got nothing to mm. do with him. It's purely yeah. just to do with the, the the gift, quote unquote, gift was that was given to him from the emperor. And how that was just his torture, um, and it's yeah, it's super sad, it's super sad, and you know, up until actually reading the the Night Lords books by um, uh, ADB, Aaron Dembski Bowden, I hated, I thought they were really lame, and the the Night Lord books, pfft, top tier, absolute top tier. That trilogy is amazing. Personally, I actually find a lot of the the in that middle section of story arc. Chaos books are really good because they have cohe- a cohesive story rather than just yeah. bolt upon. Um, you know, even the um, the Fabius Bile books as well. Ah, oh, they're great. They're so good, and they connect mm. all sorts of stuff from Necrons, Harlequins, Eldari, um, Drakari as well, massively in there. Um, Chaos, Abaddon's in there, like everything. It's just, it's really, really good. It's really, really, really well written too. Yeah. Um, I mean, we, we spent quite a long time going over Space Marines and the Horus Heresy. Um, so it's very quickly I'll mention because there's currently the, the book I'm most excited for is the the new Necron book which is coming out. Oh yeah. Um, so I, I thought I would throw out a recommendation for anyone who's who's still listening. It's like, well, I'm not interested in. You know, space marines doing space marine things. Brother, brother, brother. Um, there's, there's a bunch of... I mean, there's not there's not a great many of them. Yeah, it's a shame. But they are, they're expanding the, the Xenos books, um, which is great. Uh, the recent the recent Necron book, The Infinite and the Divine, absolutely phenomenal. It's Trazen, One right? of the best... It's Trazen and Orokan. Yeah. And it's basically just them, like hilariously feuding for millions millions of years, of years yeah is it about like it's, it's about him is it about him setting up his vault no it, it isn't it isn't he's he has the vault already okay. throughout the thing and he's, he's adding to it and taking from it and, and curating it that's all that's all going on um it's so funny how they've just literally popped that character from marvel he's literally the collector he's very similar yeah i, I would argue a, a more interesting one though um, but he, but basically the book is, the book is fantastic. Um, the book balances this grim, like horror of the Necron and the 40k universe with this sort of twisted sense of humor that runs throughout the whole thing. Um, cause it's, in, it's set, the, it's set in the past, right? Like it is set like tw- set, 20 million like, years it, ago or whatever. It's like 50 million years ago, oh, right, all okay. the way up to the present. Like it, it, there's several big time jumps in it. Um, and it's... I don't give away too much because there's actually genuinely potentially setting altering things that go on in it. Okay. Um, depending on, on if they actually pick up any of those threads or not. Mm-hmm. Which I'm kind of hoping they do because it would be really interesting. And but, is, um, is this book relevant to that book? No. The new one? The new one? I don't know. I've read it yet. It's only just been put up for pre-order. No, but I mean, um, I'm assuming you know the so plot, it's, it's right? It's called, it's called the, the, twice, the Twice Get Dead King Ruin. And then Twice Dead King Reign is coming out afterwards. Um, oh, so is it? It's essentially so it's, about. Is it about, about the a, Silent a King different... and Sautek fighting? Is this... No, no, no. It's about a, like an entirely different Necron Overlord. Oh. It, it seems like it's, more, it's a, again a more of a self-contained one. But the sense I get is that in a similar vein to the Infinite and the Divine, it is going to sort of tie in a little bit. Think of it like the Necrons themselves getting a smaller version of the Marvel treatment where where it's sort of you get this entirely separated character story but it kind of ties back to the main the main plot 
Then there's another one. It's an entirely separate character story, but it kind of ties back into the main plot. Mm. Um, I mean, because I reckon how they haven't written the whole... I mean, they haven't even explored the narrative where they know that um, Imhotep and Silent King are going to punch on, right? Like, Yeah. I mean, I think... I think the, the problem with that is that... And, and it's something that I, I think they're going to run into a bit more... And that they're going to have to deal with at some point. Is that the way they've structured the, the setting... The main story is about humanity. But the way they've, like, I guess, essentially power scaled the races against them is that there's not enough of them to, awake. to show yeah, that. Okay, right. I get you. Well, it's not even that. They're, they're, how do you show the Silent King, you know, fighting against another Necron Empire, another Necron without dynasty? Without all of them being awake. Without. Yeah. Well, not, not even that. Just without, like, busting the galaxy open. Yeah. Like, it's. The, the the way they've they've put put it together, the Silent King is is an emperor level character, if not potentially more powerful. Like that's the way that they've set it up. He really, is, I thought he was like he's the Silent. King I thought he was the Primarch mark, like, level, and then no. the I mean maybe Katan, physically, but as far as the as far well, it's the thing. The Silent King is the leader of the race that broke the Katan sixty five million years before humanity existed. Like it's. The, 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 and that, that's, that's the but whole just because he's the into. leader doesn't necessarily mean he's an all powerful no. leader, though, right? No, no, like, exactly, exactly. It's yeah. not him specifically that has the power, but he yeah. wields that power. He's the master of that power. He's in command of that. Yeah. And so, any and I think it's the reason they've kind of got oh he's back, and they've kind of gone well. Let's not actually tell any stories with him because it kind of breaks the scale of the setting. In the same way that yeah. I don't think the emperor will ever return outside of like an end times event the way they did with, with when they squatted Warhammer Fantasy, mm. I think they've kind of gone, oh, we actually can't really tell any stories where he's a major player because it just kind of breaks the scale of the setting a bit. Yeah, but I don't, yeah, I don't think... That God Blight proves that that's not what they're doing. Without spoilers. But again, I mean, to a, to a point, but as far as like having the Emperor as a playable model on the table and and having him as like an active this character running around doing stuff kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like in the, phys- like, in like, the physical world and whatever. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Exactly, they can't, yeah, yeah, they can't do that. Yeah, Because like the Emperor being... And like, it would be dumb anyway. It'd be, fucking, yeah. it'd be lame. It would be, yeah. Yeah. Um, and look, to be honest, I still stand by, I reckon, what's going to happen, Golden Throne's going to shut down, the Astronomicon's still going to run, and, which is a theory from um, Luton, but I think it's heading towards that way that um, the emperor becomes the first positive god but he can't right. he can't get to that stage because he's until he does because, and, because he's still alive his physical body yeah. is still alive I mean th- there's a bunch of, of different theories around that and, and the grey knights having their part to play and, and all that kind of stuff but do you um, okay so yeah. coming back to the necrons do you think yeah. because there are other katans right that exist yeah well so, so there, there's four main ones that like the Imperium has kind of like encountered enough to go. These, these are like the four big ones. Which that, is the that Deceiver, we know of. Nightbringer, the, tr- but, the trick uh, one that died, which the Deceiver so killed. There's, there's, or deceived. there's the Deceiver, there's the Nightbringer, there's the Outsider, and then there's um, the Void Dragon. Ah, oh, which is the one who died? Uh, the Flayer, Landugor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, and they're the yeah. ones who. He, and the Deceiver killed him. But then there's also there's also a whole bunch of others as well. Okay. Yeah, that's what I mean. So there's more, right? Yeah. So yeah, but but the the old law was basically that there were only four left at the end of the Katan all eating each other, uh, and the new law is kind of like these are just the main ones, and the other shards are like around, I guess. Yeah, it's never particularly clear on that one. But they're all still shards, not actual full Katan, right? Yeah. The only the only potentially complete Katan would be the Outsider, and because it, he kind of just left. Yeah, he's e- e- extra galactical, right? Yeah. Which the Silent King was as well for a while, but then he's kind of like, oh no, he's been back for... Tyranny. He, he knew Sanguinius, so he's been back for 10,000 years. No, he didn't know Sanguinius. That was Imhotep, right? No, no, that was Silent King. Oh. Because he, he, he meets oh, of Dante course, and he's, he's then, then, mask. And then he gets... Um, Tycho's getting all pissed off because he's like, yeah, you're not yeah, fucking yeah. talking to us, you fucking nerd. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was I, hilarious, I mean, it's, that it's scene. It's just one of those... <laughs> it was. So stupid. Um... 
the Necro's like, why are they opening their hands yeah, like that? So maybe it's a, maybe it's a greeting. So dumb. I mean, it's funny. Yeah. It's cool. It, it will look. It was funny if you didn't take it seriously. But you take it seriously. Yeah, yeah. You're like, this is stupid. This makes no sense yeah. in any of yeah. your stories. Why the hell would they yeah. be communicating? Yeah. Um, um, but I mean, I think that's the problem they're going to run into a fair bit with a lot of well, mainly the Tyranids and the Necrons, where they've kind of they've set up this galaxy-ending threat that they can't do anything with. Well, I mean, because they've curved they, it pretty well because when they do with Octarius, yeah. right? With the Tyranids, yeah, well, yeah. I mean, but that's the thing they they have to put them into this stalemate condition and then leave them. Yeah, but I mean, so that's if, kind of what you have as to they do advance. Everything. Yeah, of course. But it just means that, that it, unfortunately, we're not going to get too much in the way of... You can't really advance the Silent King's, you know, unity plan too far before it becomes a major problem for humanity. Yeah. And, and in a similar way, you can't advance the Tyranid's invasion of, of the galaxy too far before it becomes an, uh, too big of a problem for humanity. Yeah. Um, I mean, you... Yeah. The only thing I would say that is diff- different now is the fact that faith is a thing. Which it, is we, oh, which is yeah. not warp like it is, but in, it isn't. Which yeah, which, that's, that's a really I'm gonna say interesting concept to to get your head around. Yeah, it's super weird, um, yeah. and it does date all the way back to the Horus Heresy. It does, yes. Because I, in fact, I'm I'm reading and hearing about the first first bits of that now yeah. as I'm rereading to do with uh, Euphrates Keeler and reading. Garrow and yeah. all those guys. Which is literally yeah. where Malkador says, "This is interesting. We need to like." test this where actually where the strength of someone's faith in the emperor was giving them powers and he couldn't he couldn't understand why you know being as epic as a sucker as he was he couldn't understand it's not directly psychic but it's not not psychic so you know this could be something that this is kind of if written correctly you know the emperor becomes a god dies off the throne still maintains the astronomicon because why does he have to be there if he's a god? I'm pretty sure he can just be like, yeah, my whole people, all my people can see. Um, and then lean heavily in the faith thing. And that can be the new, the new weapon that the Necrons don't know how to fight or whatever. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. maybe yeah, yeah. that's something that necessarily, that, that takes that power away from them. Not, not entirely, but you know, brings yeah, them yeah, back yeah. to a level of manageability. Yeah. You know. And I mean, like, like for that matter, like, I, I'm sure that the, given the way they've been treating everything, as you said, given the Marvel treatment, where they've kind of got a plan for it. They've definitely got least, a plan at least, for faith to yeah. be a legit thing. Yeah. Because so, it's, given that, it's like, I'm not worried new, about... New books. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm not worried about like how it's going to go and how they're going to handle it. It's just a, it's just a, note, a note that um, you're not... I wouldn't expect to see much major, like, Silent King level Necron stuff going on in the near future. But it's annoying that because really outside of Eldari, you don't have another Xenos race and don't you dare say Tau that is worth no, t- t- stories. T- t- there are bigger races, more important races in the galaxy than Tau that have never appeared on the table. Oh, you, in, no. I'm, in current canon, yeah. there are bigger, more relevant yes. Xenos races than Tau yes. that have never had models and have never appeared in much more than I know, but like a few lines here and there in other books. That's irrelevant for anyone who's actually getting lore, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in terms of the factions that exist on tabletop that would get lore, as in that's non-Imperium, non-Chaos, yeah. if you remove Necrons... Well, well the next ones are getting law. No, I know. It's in like enough. Like it's a sh- it's a sh- law. Yeah, it's a shame mm. that they're not getting more because, um, look, there is some interesting stuff with Tau. There, there is some kind of cool things with the breakdown between Farsight and um, and the Ethereals, and then Farsight and Shadow Sun. It is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, they just have a whole lot of weird issues with their life expectancy and stasis and all sorts of that crap. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, if they are super technically advanced, just give them FTL. Just, just give them some way yeah. of doing it. You know, like I mean, I mean, they, they, they kind of do. They, they've got the whole, uh, I forget what they call them, like skip drives that they just skim the edge of the warp. Um, and do stuff like that. Yeah, but they still don't actually have like fast and light travel, though, right? Uh, like they, they can't they have kind, they kind of they kind of do because they're what fifth sphere which is the one they're supposed to be doing except for the what 
I, I think so the fourth sphere expansion they were like they, they had a war proof and like well let's just send a bunch of ships yeah and, and it's just gone and that went about as well as you would expect yeah 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 um we- and so all the ships basically the ships that went in were all like because they, they which they flew into the warp with no geller fields and there's su- and suddenly demons um we- there's, there's actually some really interesting interesting lore around that as well um, so I think I, I think I was listening to an episode of um of lore hammer and I think um I, one of the I think Mark one of the guys was talking about a really cool way of doing that like his say has as 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 um unlikely as it is that they go through they're actually not in there long enough to get like tainted by too many demons and then just end up being on the opposite side of the galaxy yeah well that's kind of what it is they're, they're scattered everywhere like they're, they're just kind of gone and there's bits of them all over the galaxy oh so that has has actually happened I thought they, they, uh, no, as far as I understand it yeah I didn't think no, they not, were actually they, they haven't put any they haven't no, they they disappeared. As far as the main That's tower what I'm saying. Like they, no one knows where they actually are, right? Like t- for all but I believe they're still in the warp. Oh, I be- no, I believe that that we've started to, or we've we've had bits of law here and there that some of them are out or that they've been noticed in different places in the galaxy. Right, because I mean, that's the way to get around their FTL problem and then instead of them yeah. actually having FTL, it's like they're actually, no, they're in 10 spots around the... I mean, not that it, it still wouldn't be an issue for the Imperium, right? They would just be like, whatever, no, no. we don't care. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, But, I don't know. I think that's that's one thing I think that needs to happen is make Tau a proper player or don't, right? Remove them from the game and the law. Or make them a player. Otherwise, what's the what's the point of them being there? Yeah. Um, because I, mean, I, I think they've, they've got room to do that now with the moving setting as well. Yeah, 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 100%. I mean, um, you know, the rift for them is great. <laughs> it's, yeah. a, it's a really yeah, it good thing. It means that they can, you know, expand massively without any hindrance from the Imperium. And they yeah. know how to handle Tyranids. They know how to, well, kind of. And they know how to well, handle yeah. Orcs pretty well. Kind of. Yeah. Again, also kind of, but um, Imperium, like they can't handle the Imperium, you know. And this is just that buffer. And I hope, well, they, I hope they go down this path. Yeah. To do yeah. that. Yeah, and look, let, they let haven't even a bigger player. They haven't let even them... faced chaos yet, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like at I mean, all. There, there's a really, there's really interesting stuff there with Farsight because they have. Um, and there was that whole thing where Farsight got that vision of himself as a as a corn champion and stuff. Oh what? No uh, way! I didn't know that. Yeah, he he had like this vision of himself wielding wielding his demons because he's basically got like a demon sword, I believe. What the blade thing? Yeah, the... uh, and he's like because he's got basically no presence in the warp, it's not really affecting him too much. Oh right, so but he technically kind of, can't be possessed, it's... right? Well, it, uh, they they haven't really explored it too much. Right, they're just kind of like he has this demon sword, and he's kind. Of, it's kind of like maybe keeping him alive for a lot longer than it should. Oh, that's cool. Um, and he's had this vision of himself as a corn champion, that would... and so not really understood what it is. Because um, that, that was his whole thing: was he fought a bunch of corn demons? It was like none of this makes any sense, and the Imperials died, and and he went off and did his own thing. Yeah, right. Um, oh yeah, because yeah. then the demons killed the Imperials, and then the 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 spell was broken. Yeah, like the the Farsight book is this really weird blend of absolutely nonsensical, like weird, like. Uh, things like the Imperium just make does make stupid decisions, and like for whatever reason, Tau is the, the Tau is just like super effective for whatever reason. Mm. Obviously, because it's their book and stuff. But then also some really really interesting character ideas and 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 stuff. Mm. Um, so if you get the chance to read it and sort of you know go into it with a bit of a, eh, but it, it's worth having a read. Uh, yeah, I think they yeah. need some they need some good attention because the Xenos in general need some really good lore attention. lore attention. I'm I mean, they're, they're doing it. They're doing some. it with Eldari. They definitely are, with the whole Inaid thing. They and... were, oh. and they cancelled the books. Oh, did they? Yeah. Why? Yeah. Obviously, they weren't selling. Appar- apparently, they they weren't selling well, which has nothing at all to do with the fact that the rate, most of that range is older than I am. Yeah. If, yeah. I mean, it, I'm ho- I'm hopeful that when they they do more Eldar, when they do the new Eldar Codex. Um, they give it a, like a range refresh like they have with the Necrons and the Orcs and then people and then they like re-release all the Inari books and then hopefully that means people buy them and are actually into them and we get more lore for them 
But... Yeah, it's weird though, right? Because I mean, you would have thought that some Drakari stories would have come out with the with the Drakari release. Do you know how many like Drakari focused books there are? Zero. None. Yeah, zero. Yeah. Because they're yeah. super fucked up. Yeah. It would be like super corked, man. Like even in. Yeah, it would be, but. I mean, it'd be awesome. Forty K as a whole, I know. Is, like it'd, it'd, be, be, amazing. it'd be amazing. It'd be amazing. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Yeah. In in Manflayer and um, Primogenitor and whatever, all the um, <clears throat> Fabius Bible books, um, the, the descriptions of the the Dark Eldar scenes are yeah. horrific. They are yeah. full on, and it's amazing. And it's and even in comparison to Fabius Bile, who is nuts as well in terms of what he does to people and things, it's still nuts. It's it's. I mean, they've had what like. They're so cool. Tw- tw- 20,000 years or whatever of torture. They, they, they've got to become pretty creative in all that time. Who? The Dark Elder. 20,000? What do you mean? Oh, yeah, of course, because the fall was yeah, only 20,000 years. Yeah, fall... yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the fall, I, I'm sorry, the fall might have been like 30,000 years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that, but yeah. They, they, they've had a horrendously long time to get real good at torture. Well, and they people. do it every hour, right? Because yeah, otherwise the time, they die. Because they have to. <laughs> yeah. And then they get eaten to death. You know, by Slanish. It's, I mean, the, the, yeah, the, the Dark Elder lore is horrific. In, like, 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 if you wanted a bad guy for forty k, there it. Like, oh, there like, it. Not, man. Not, not, not like overall evil, but just like immoral. Just like morally, they're cooked. Exactly. Like, Super like they're cooked. They are. I mean, you can imagine them as we talked about with like skeletal British accents and twirling mustaches of like just evil, like just bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like homunculus, homunculi, or whatever. They're they're a whole another level of epic. Um, yeah, and it's cool. It's it, it, again, it falls back into the kind of inspiration from you know nineteenth century alchemy and all that sort of stuff. Like it's cool. It makes it yeah. it makes total sense. Because I mean, if you if you want to see where the real origins of this stuff come from, look up alchemy. It was re- people did kind of really cooked shit like the like the Drakari did in real life yeah. not that long ago <laughs> yeah. it's pretty nuts um yeah. you know so um okay obviously it wasn't sustaining their souls but you know it it um it's all based on some sense of realism but they're mm. I don't know I think there's some it's it's really similar the Harlequins and Drakari uh have really um they're like this not you can do whatever you want kind of character story potentials but kind of like they're, they're a bit of like a blank slate for what you want to do with them and the whole thing There's, to do with yeah. the black library and um oh yes what's his name you're in with Araman what's his name uh Segarak Segarak or Kegarak the, the or laughing whatever, god the laughing god yeah. the actual the last li- last known living real Eldar god yeah it's just the of, it's of such a cool concept. It's so yeah. cool, and now the fact that there are other, there are Imperium people looking for it. You got Armin kicking around. Who apparently, has been in it multiple times. Yeah, which is not true. And then the th- other other forms of the Thousand Suns outside of Aramana are looking for it. And this is current law. Yeah. So this is literally mm, yeah. ninth edition current law. The Eldar yeah. know and are trying to stop them all from getting there. It's just yeah cool it's really cool and the implications of what happens and what's in it Mm. and the whole concept of a nuncia and what a nuncia is the language Mm. of the universe it's those are the kinds of things i really want them to to double down on because they're really cool concepts it's an exciting time to be a 40k law fan yeah yeah it is um so i think i think we'll probably wrap it up about here we've been talking for a long um, time we have yeah good stuff um but lucky if you had a recommendation for the people to start reading and, and, and if they wanted to get into 40k or, or reading some stuff okay uh, where would you go with that if if you want a good space marine book and you don't mind listening to a female with an english accent which personally i think is always awesome um emperor spears or Spear of the Emperor, um, by Aaron Dempsey Bowden. That's like a modern post rift whatever. 
for chaos. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm gonna probably say Fabius Bile or the Night Lord series. Go start there. Um mm -hmm. for I guess just general understanding the forty K verse and yeah, the best trilogy ever is the Eisenhorn series. Mm. Yeah. That is yeah. that's I reckon one of the best and then obviously Heresy as we said, the first three. Just start at the yeah. beginning. Just start at the beginning, it's easiest. And just check out Audible, man. You know, not you, I'm a big advocate for it. I love it. I do mm. it. I pretty much read a book a day, whether it be 40k mm. or not, or something else. You know, as I was saying, I was reading Harry Potter and whatever. Audible's so good. Now, I understand, like, you don't like Audible because you prefer to read. No, I, 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 I prefer oh, you do to do read some, books yeah, yeah. because I, I, I like to be able to go back and reference and, and check things. But I do use Audible to, to listen while I'm working because I just don't have the, the time or the opportunity to read all the time. So Audible is a, is a fantastic tool. It's such a great tool, um, man. We're, we're not sponsored. Like, it's not a thing. Nah, but do it but, anyway, eh? Hey, but it's good. It's so worth, it. worth yeah. it. It's so worth it. I think I, I did a track and I've spent like 1500 bucks on books. <laughs> <laughs> this is like 90-something books, man. Yeah. I've read in like mm. nine months or whatever. It's crazy. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. it's those yeah um yeah so yeah those are all good good books to look into as well and say if you if you're looking for xenos stuff um the infinite and the divine still one of the best modern 40k books hands down and then the part yeah um, that elder one if you're the path of the elder path, series yeah. it's, uh, is it gav thorpe i think so yeah um he he gets the elder probably the best out of most of the writers there mm. um and it's, it's been a passion project for him and you can you can kind of tell in a lot of what he writes as well yeah that's cool. um so yeah, for Xenos, look at them. For Imperium, look, the Dark Imperium trilogy, Dark Imperium, Plague War, and Godblight. They're really, yeah, um, I think they're probably a really good they're, way they're because just, they're modern, they're, they're, they're current. They're foundational for the current yeah. story. And they're, they've yeah. got some good things. And then, you know, if you want Custodes books, uh, Regent Shadow and the Watcher's mm. Throne, they're awesome. Chris yeah. Ray, Chris Ray is probably my favorite writer out of all the 40k writers. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, I'll echo I'll echo your statement about the Horus Heresy. Start with the first three. I recommend Galaxy and Flames. Start with that one as your first one, and mm. then go back and read the first two. But if you want to start at the the very beginning, then yeah, Horus Rising uh, to start with. It is a good book. Yeah, and then after that, pick what you want. Yeah, um, or just read all sixty of them like I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it gets it gets tough. It gets yeah. tough. Mm. But um, I think on that note, we'll we'll leave it there for today. Thank you for listening, uh, as always. Make sure to uh, check out Dice Arcade and use code Risky Rollers for a discount. Check out our Discord, our Patreon for all sorts of exciting stuff happening there. Yep, like as well as our Instagrams for all the models we're working on. That's it. Like and subscribe. Yep. And um, we'll uh, talk to you guys next week. Bye. Bye. Hmm. What's... Mm. 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 Uh, that was that was me making some sort of noise to see if you're back. I oh, to see if your recording was working. No, as in to to prompt a response from you to know if you were back or not. I literally came and said I'm back. I wasn't here. <laughs> oh, I, I wasn't. Okay. I, I, I wasn't back. I just oh, got back. <laughs> right. I thought you were there because I was like I'm back, and then you're just like, mm. I'm like mm, what? <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I walked in, put the headphones on, and then went, mm, and then went. I probably should have said something rather than just making a noise.